All right, welcome to our discussion, right? It's not really a lesson, it's a discussion on do you think you might have an emotional attachment for, to food? And and I have a lot to say to you guys, but um, we're here because I care. And my hope is, is that at the end of our discussion, and I don't know if it's going to last for 30 minutes or an hour, uh, it's whatever you really need from it, that you might have information that will allow you to self-care for yourself as well in a better way. So want to mention that to you. Um, I know as a nutritionist and a fitness professional for what have I been doing this for? 35 plus years, I've had a lot of conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with clients over all these years, hundreds of people, thousands of conversations, and um, people are trying to gain control of their food choices. And people have been on a multitude of diets and spent a multitude of dollars and end up where they were or worse off following these diets or exercise programs or whatever combination of things they did because they have such a severe connection to food. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's overwhelming for those of you who have been in this spot. So my hope is today is that we can identify if this might be you and that there is help for you. And I think that the Mama G lifestyle is the perfect anecdote to all that ails you, but it doesn't deal with the psychological piece and that brain and gut calling to one another. And I'll, and I'll mention it for those of you who have never heard me say it, but for those of you who don't hear me say it, when you have anxiety, stress, happiness, whatever your feelings are that are excessive. It's usually right here that's calling this to the food. There's a disconnect here. And it's like, well, I feel this here. And your brain says, well, if you feed me those things that I want, you're going to feel so much better. So my hope is, is that you will this might resonate with you. So one more time, I'll say it. You can remove your name. If you do want to remain anonymous by simply going into your name on the participants, clicking on more and change your name to A or B or C or one, two, three, whatever you want. If, um, again, this is not being shared with anyone, um, but you might want anonymity within this phone call right now. So here we go. My name is Gina and I'm a recovering anorexic, orthorexic, disordered eater. And I'm recovering also from telling people what to do. Did you know that was a disorder? It is. <laughs> Everything I've done, all these exias I've had was to control the areas in my life that I could because so much in my life has been and still is beyond my control. I happen to also be a trained chef and I'm a highly educated nutrition professional with my bachelor's in dietetics and my master's of science in integrative and functional nutrition. And for more than 30 years, I have been a certified group exercise instructor and personal trainer. So all of those disorders that I talked about, I'm really good at and I understand them well. So here's my story. I grew up in a, a very Italian household. My dad was an Italian immigrant. My mother grew, was born in New York. She went back to Italy as a young child. And my parents came out to California when my dad was hired by Hughes Aircraft Company. And we lived really the Mediterranean lifestyle. We, we had uh, food from my dad's garden. Um, we ate um, things as very close to nature as possible until we moved into the 70s or so when coupons became very popular and people and my mom loved coupons and being uh, 
um, my mom and my dad grew up as teenagers in the depression, they, they understood the struggle for money. They were both very, you know, modest, low, lower class in terms of income, uh, families and money was tight and you didn't waste tight. So when coupons came about, we saw a lot of those couponed items, which are not fruits and vegetables or, or animal, you know, dairy or all those things. It's usually things that at that point in time in the seventies, more highly processed. We didn't really get too much in the ultra process. So cans and bottles of different things. So we started to have that little bit of an influx, but dinners in my house were pasta with vegetables. So there was always a pasta thrown into water with vegetables thrown in there and you ate it like a soup. And then we'd have some kind of protein with it, typically a lean protein and salad. And when we had company, we'd have nuts and seeds and fruit at the table. And then we'd have dessert. It was all part of the bringing the family around the kitchen table. And it was really a wonderful environment to grow in, grow up in and grow into. My dad went to the YMC, I think every single day of the majority of his adult life um, while he lived in Westchester, which is where I grew up. Um, but I also had the experience of knowing that my oldest sister, who was 16 years older than me, my 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 best friend, my second mom and my everything, um, she was on a diet from high school. And of course, I was born when she was in high school. But once I start to understand and learn, she was on every diet that she could have been on. Uh, until she died at the age of 46 from breast cancer that she fought from the age of 35. And in reality, I truly believe, but we don't have facts that the food stuff that she was consuming, you know, I feel like was likely the reason that she had breast cancer because, you know, she again grew up in the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s. She passed in 93 and she, consume diet everything and um she had been on the bacon diet and the cabbage soup diet and the, any diet out there she was on it she was constantly changed ch chasing the scale i would say she was no more than probably 10 or 15 pounds overweight but she was committed to her walking program and she just wanted to be like twiggy and uh of course she 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 aspired that goal when she, um, you know, got cancer and ended up passing away at the age of 46. And I say that because, you know, it's just such a tragic, tragic scenario. Um, my mom was always on a diet as well. She was just very good though about restricting food. So she wasn't never on a formal diet, but if she perhaps didn't like the way something was fitting, she could easily pull back on her food choices. She had a a lot of resiliency and willpower, perhaps between my her, my mom and my dad. That is where I have this genetic predisposition for willpower and resiliency. So I'll take that. Um, but my dad went on his first formal diet that I ever knew about when I was a senior, maybe a, maybe a junior or so in high school. And up until that point, my dad uh, was a Trader Joe's guy. We had one of the first Trader Joe's in Westchester where I grew up. So he always had his nuts and his dried fruit. Um, he, uh, as I said, had a garden. So we had always had a plethora of fruit and vegetables in the home as well. And he was very mindful of his food choices. But I think by the time I was in high school, he was probably about 60 years of age. And, uh, you know, his body probably shifted a little bit. Again, my dad was likely never more than about five or 10 pounds over what he wanted to be um, because he had self, such self-control and he was such a committed exerciser and such a great eater. But we had Prevention Magazine that would, that would always be in the little basket or whatever next to the toilet in his bathroom and inevitably you know you look at national geographic and these things and he was a big fan of of uh, prevention magazine and it was a great opportunity to you know kind of it was one of the first magazines that gave you some clear um advice and pretty decent advice regarding exercise and nutrition. But at some point, my dad learned about the Scarsdale diet. And again, this was about my junior, senior year in high school. And he um, went on it. Now, um, 
he probably only needed to go on it for a few weeks because it was so restrictive. I think it was probably about a thousand calories that um, you would consume during this time. And um, I'm sure he lost weight very quickly and then it went away. But what I remember was that Scarsdale diet, he must have had a mimeograph, not a video, not a, what do we call it? Copy machine, whatever we call it now, but I'm sure it was one of those Xeroxes or whatever. And he had probably taken it from a magazine or from a friend or got the book from the library and it was sitting on the kitchen counter. And it was like, well, I still actually have the original copy in my possession and I should have pulled it out. Um, but when you look at the Scarsdale diet, it is in incredibly really restrictive in terms of the type of food you're eating, in terms of the ultimate calories that you're consuming. So we fast forward and I was a swimmer in high school, um, not very good novice team. I wish I would have been an athlete my whole life, but we never really had um, formal sports for females when I was growing up in my town, but I loved the thought of being on a team. And, and uh, my sister kind of introduced me to the swim team when she had all three of my nephews swimming. So I had the opportunity to join the swim team as a novice and I was awful, but I loved the camaraderie. And they that's where I got my first study. Uh, they used to call me Mama Fridella way back in high school because I used to take care of the team and feed the team. But um, there was a point in high school that I wanted to be thinner. And I saw that diet sitting on the kitchen counter and I started it because I have extreme willpower and resiliency. And, you know, I had this idea of just being thinner and I had probably just finished with the swim team and all of those kind of things. So that exercise kind of went away. And, you know, I, I stuck very strictly to it because it was very boxed up, right? I think you had a slice of bread. There was no mention of the type of bread because back then we didn't really have whole wheat, whole grain bread, unless you went to the granola, you know, health food stores. Um, I think you had a half of a grapefruit. And I think that was about it for breakfast. I'll, when I pull it out, I'll pull it together for you guys. Lunchtime, you could have um, some cheese or lunch meat. You got to love the lunch meat, right? The highly processed, full of sodium lunch meat. Um, and then I think you could have some like sliced tomatoes. It was very minimal, tiny amount of calories in a box. And the same thing for dinner, you could have some lean protein and some salad. And so ultimately you're consuming well under a thousand calories a day. The weight drops off. You're consuming few carbohydrates as well. So you're losing water weight and it gives you a very false sense of um, success. And I, um, and that really did spark my um, couple month experience. Um, I always say I was a borderline anorexic before anorexia really wasn't part of the DSM-5 um, disordered um, psychology manual. But so I, I love being thin. Um, my weight today is about 120 pounds. When I was younger, I probably weighed about 150, 10 to 115 pounds. I certainly didn't have as much muscle mass as I have now. But when I was a senior in high school, I weighed 98 pounds soaking wet. And you could see my collarbones and my hip bones. And I remember going to my 10-year anniversary, anniversary, reunion, and my friends saying, oh my gosh, you look so great. You were so thin our senior year. And of course, I thought I looked fantastic, uh, but you quickly learn about yourself. So, you know, I went from this bit of anorexia uh, and then kind of dropping all of that and then working at Swenson's Ice Cream Parlor over the course of the summer. And now when you have all this restriction and now we were exposed to ice cream the whole shift you were there i tell you that we tasted every single ice cream although i was very picky with my ice creams i like nuts and chocolates and certain things and by the end of summer my clothes didn't fit and i was uh, just 17 and a few months years of age and i went off to ucsd for college uh very young and very unhappy with my weight 
So of course you go off to college. Now there's the drinking and the making of chocolate chip cookies and eating dough at midnight with all of your friends and maybe a little pot smoking and all of those things that are going on. And so I was really unhappy with my weight. So I started to try to play the diet game, but it was no longer successful because I had gone from this really restrictive and punitive diet approach to over the top. And now I, my body was very confused. And I remember going into the big library at UCSD, which looks like a spaceship and going to the, probably the diet section and pulling out the book on fasting. And I remember that I fasted. I ate nothing but drinking water for 10 days straight. This is my very first trimester of college. And at the end of the 10 days, you were supposed to start to eat some rice and, and very, very restricted kind of um, bringing you back to a normal eating plan. But I will tell you, after starving yourself for 10 days straight, drinking only water, there's no holding back on anything. And so then that just went back into this kind of uh, disordered kind of binge eating. And I, I attempted to become a purger, but I was never good at throwing up and who wants to throw up anyway. And at that point I ended up getting, um, mono. And, uh, by the time I got home for Christmas time, I weighed more about two pounds more than I weighed when I was nine months pregnant with my, my firstborn daughter, which I weighed more than I, you know, with her that I, I only gained maybe 35 pounds or so, but I weighed more with her than my second child, my son, and, and then with my twins. <laughs> so it tells you a little bit of something that I was, I weighed more than that. So got back from uh, home and, and I remember, by the way, that entire time that I was in at home for, for break, Christmas break, I had gotten a big, beautiful, soft, fluffy, yellow bathrobe. And I think I wore that thing you know, tightened up to my neck the entire time I was home because I was so mortified about what my body looked like. But I know over probably the three or four weeks that I was home that I probably, you know, was right back to my Mediterranean household diet that my parents were feeding me and that I'd probably lost some weight over that time. And by the time I got back to school, I ended up joining the local family fitness and spent another semester or so, uh, finished out that year at UCSD and then um, played the little bit of the yo-yo diet game, but always going on the diet and then, uh, um, you know, maybe overindulging, but having no real game plan, but at least coming back to a weight that at least I felt more comfortable with. But I know on the regular that, that I'd gain the couple of pounds for somebody five foot two, five pounds is another size of clothing. So I played the game and was not happy until I finally had the ability to finish up my, I left UCSD when I met my husband, by the way, because I knew that I was never going to go to medical school and become the OBGYN that I had thought I was going to be, um, went to the local community college, got my AA in culinary arts, started my apprenticeship with the Hilton Corporation down there on Mission Bay in San Diego. And, uh, did that for a while and then realized once we got married that I had to work on Christmas and I was not uh, into the lifestyle of a chef. And so that's when I started my education, got my bachelor's degree in uh, dietetics and then, uh, you know, went on to uh, raise a family. And for my entire adult life, I was a um, uh, certified personal trainer and group exercise instructor where I taught all of my clients about nutrition. And then as many of you know, I went on uh, once I became an empty nester to get my master's degree in integrative and functional nutrition. So that's my story. What I know about myself is that um, I, um, you know, based on my life experiences, you know, my anorexia, my disordered eating, uh, my orthorexia, which is where you use exercise and healthy eating to control your weight, my type A personality, uh, and the fact that I'm also a control freak, um, and, that, and then pair that with lots of tragedies, that all stoked my control issues. And now, um, now in my life, I have lots of people that I love and care for immensely who have food, alcohol, drug addictions, and other harmful behaviors that affect me personally. 
water. So ultimately, the Mama G's lifestyle is the repercussion of my life experiences. Um, not only have I recovered from all, all my exias, I would say the anorexias and the orthorexias, all my exias, but I'm also a grateful member of Al-Anon, uh, which has helped me to detach with love, no longer attempting to fix those who have food, alcohol, uh, fix those who don't want to be fixed, which allows me to find peace and serenity. So that's me. So let's talk about you. I want to take you through um, some ideas. And this is what I'm going to introduce you to Overeaters Anonymous, because I think that so many of my clients um, struggle with disordered eating. Um, you spent a lot of money over the course of your life on diets and exercise and all types of things, maybe Mama G, but hopefully that's a good part of your life. But what's great about all of these 12-step step, 12 programs, um, Overeaters Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, Narcotics Anonymous, and then the, the Al-Anons for those of us who care for these people and love these people, is that they're free. And I will always say in my Al-Anon meetings, this is the, the best, you know, the cheapest therapy I will, could ever look for and potentially the best therapy. And so it's important to me to be able to introduce this to you. So the journey begins. And so I'm going to ask you to ask yourself these questions. Have you tried over and over again to control your eating and your weight, but nothing has worked? Compulsive eating, under eating, food addiction, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, over-exercising or the combination, which we call orthorexia. No matter how your challenge with food or body image is, you're welcome in Overeaters Anonymous, right? And I am doing this because I love all of you. And I, I was gifted Al-Anon, you know, to deal with all the people in my life who have addictions that I wish I could fix, but I can't. And so now it's my gift to you to introduce you to this. So let's dive in and le learn a little bit more about Overeaters Anonymous. Um, getting to know you and getting to know all about OA is what we're going to do here for the next little bit. Number one, people at OA, it, it OA is for anyone struggling with food or trying to determine if they have food issues too. OA members believe compulsive eating is a disease like alcoholism is a disease. Three, OA members believe our life changing approach in our life changing approach to physical, emotional, and spiritual, and based on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So what's next, you ask. So let's talk about that. I want to have you take a quiz. Now I'm gonna I will put the link to this quiz. Um, for all of you in the chat bar, but I'll do it towards the end and you can grab it. Um, but I want you to just maybe mark on your paper, use your fingers, whether you answer yes or no. Number one, I do I eat when I'm not hungry and not eat when my body needs? Do I eat when I'm not hungry or not eat when my body needs nourishment? Two, do I go on eating binges for no apparent reason, sometimes eating until I'm stuffed or feel sick? Three, do I have feelings of guilt, shame, embarrassment about my weight or the way that I eat? Four, do I eat sensibly in front of others and then make up for it when I'm alone? Five, is my eating affecting my health or the way I live my life. Okay, six. When my emotions are intense, whether positive or negative, do I find myself reaching for food? Seven. Do my eating behaviors make me or others unhappy? Eight. Have I ever used laxatives, vomiting, diuretics, excessive exercise, diet pills, or shots, or other medical interventions, including surgery, 
to try to control my weight? Eight, do I fast or severely restrict my food intake to control my weight? Nine, do I fantasize about how much better life would be if I were a different size or weight? Okay. So if you, my friends, said yes to three or more of these questions, it, if so, it is probably that you have or are well on your way to having compulsive eating problem. We have found that ways to arrest this progressive disease is to practice the 12-step recovery program of overeaters anonymous. Now I'll put the OA link for you. It's just OA.org. I don't even need to put it there. OA.org, but I'll put it there anyway. Or Sue, maybe you could throw that out there. OA.org. Um, because you can see everything that I'm talking to you about now. But I want to go on to what to expect. And then you'll be able to take that quiz yourself and it's going to lead you somewhere. So what exactly is an OA meeting? First of all, Take a deep breath. There's nothing to be nervous about. Um, you will be welcome. You'll find that you're not alone anymore. Everyone at the meeting knows where you are coming from about food. And here's what happens in a typical meeting, but all meetings are a little different. Uh, once you've found a meeting that you want to check out, you just show up. So I will tell you that when you go to the website, the meetings that I go to are on Zoom and they are all over the world or all over the country. So you're able to put in your time zone, you're able to put in the day that you're looking for, you're able to specify the type of meeting. So I suggest you look for a newcomer's meeting. I look for open meetings as somebody who is coming to these meetings as an Al-Anon, somebody who, who you know, has a problem with wanting to fix people's problems and wanting to fix people's weight problems and connection to food, but also somebody who cares, I can attend and uh, open meeting. But as a, you know, somebody who was a former recovering addict, I really can kind of go to any meeting. But at this point in my life, I'm looking to help uh, people in my life who I really care about. Uh, so Zoom, you can be completely anonymous, literally when, you know, depending on your time zone, you can go anytime or day or night. All right. And I love to go to my Al-Anon meetings. I go to AA meetings at least once a week because it's really important for me to sit in somebody else's shoes who has an alcohol or drug addiction. And I go to OA meetings at least once a week, because again, it's important for me to sit and see where you are at this point. On, you know, if you have active disease or how, how long you've been in recovery. So you want to set aside an hour for your meeting. You want to consider this you time. So this is about self-care and understanding that this is a commitment and if you can make the commitment, your life will change significantly. Partnered with the Mama G lifestyle, which is that food approach that will allow you to have serenity and peace in your life. You'll meet others like you uh, with a simple first name introduction and be genuinely welcomed. You get yourself settled with your group to enjoy various readings, members sharing their journeys, which is the most important part. And you learn more about OA. You can participate as little or as much as you want. You never have to open your mouth. I didn't open my mouth for five months in an Al-Anon meeting. You are welcome to share, but you don't have to. And if you have questions, you can talk with individual members after the meeting. And congratulations when you complete that first meeting. So it's really important for you to understand that the meetings are led by other members. So there's no leader telling you what to do, but there are rules and regulations to keep things smooth and calm uh, and peaceful. And they go over those rules at every single meeting, which is, I think, really important. Um, but wait, what about the weigh-in? What about paying the membership fee? There's none of that. When people come become members, they are vol they voluntary, voluntary con voluntarily contribute. So my Al-Anon meetings or the AA meetings, we give $2, which is a drop in the bucket for what I'm getting to help pay for the rent. And you never have to do that. Um, so let's recap what happens at OA. No way and no membership fee, no judgment, no religion, but it is a spiritual group. And that's, you know, potentially the hardest part for people who are not spiritual at this point. It's a safe place for everyone, all genders, all races, all ages, sexual orientations and sizes. It's a program that works. It is tried and true. 
and there's hope and there are people that will understand. So on this OA.org, you'll end up finding this meeting as well. And the couple of more things I'm going to do, and then if you have questions, we can go to it. If you don't have questions, we'll part ways. But <clears throat> I want to introduce, read you the introduction um, to the 12 steps. We of Overeaters Anonymous have found in this fellowship a way to recover from the disease of compulsive overeating. Now, remember, you heard about what that was. It's all types of disordered eating, right? Whether it's in the uh, psychiatry manual or not. Disordered eating or eating disorders, two separate entities, but all combined. We use compulsive overeating and compulsive eating interchangeably. These terms include, but are not limited to, overeating, undereating, food addiction, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, overexercising, purges, purging, and other compulsive food behaviors. No matter what form of our disease takes, having anyone having a problem with food can find help in Overeaters Anonymous. After repeated failures to control our eating and our weight, we now have a solution that works. Our solution is a program of recovery, a program of 12 simple steps. By following these steps, thousands of OA members have stopped eating compulsively. In OA, we have no program of diets and exercise, no scales, no magic pills. What we do have is offered is far greater than any of these things. A fellowship in which we find and share the healing power of our love. Our common bonds are to the disease of compulsive eating from which we have all suffered and the solution that we are finding as we live by the principles embodied in these steps. Since our program is based on the 12 steps, we'd like to offer here a study of those 12 steps, sharing how we follow them to recover from compulsive eating. We hope in this way to provide help for those who still suffer from our disease. If you think you might be a compulsive overeater, give yourself a chance for recovering by trying OA program. Our way of life based on the 12 steps and 12 traditions has brought us physical, emotional, and spiritual healing that we don't hesitate to call miraculous. What works for us will work for you too. And it doesn't matter if you're a drug addict, a food addict, a alcoholic, um, whether you have uh, really harmful behaviors that you're addicted to, whether you're somebody like me in recovery from these disordered eatings, or whether you're somebody like me who cares immensely and wants to fix all the people in my life who have all of these addictions, this program is for you. And I will tell you that I've met people who they call themselves triple qualifiers, where they not only have the addiction, they come from uh, they're children of parents who have the addiction, and now they have people in their life that they love who have the addiction. Triple winner, they call them. <laughs> so the question is, what are you? So I'm going to leave this with a couple areas, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about my experience. Um, that's, there's a book, there's lots of literature that is available at cost at the OA meetings, um, or AA or NA or Al Anon, and they're they're all the same, but they change the the person, right? Who you are, like I've talked about, and uh, I don't know why this is upside down, but there's a this is a daily reader, and people, you know, what I know about when I go to the AA and Al Anon meetings and the OA meetings is everybody says I'm a grateful member of this group. And what they say in all the meetings is keep coming back, commit to at least six different meetings, six meetings. So you can try different meetings. And then you usually will find the meeting that you feel most connected to. Um, but you got to come to six meetings. You got to try six different meetings and you got to see if this resonates with you. And the resonation will come from the people who share their stories. And that will allow you to feel connected to not only your right? Disease process, but how the disease did not steal the lives from them. So April 26th, six. And then I said, so th this is, you're going to see, I'll, I'll tell you the most important words. Many of us hear when we first come to Al-Anon, OA, AA, NA, take your pick. 
are take what you like and leave the rest. Everything about our program is suggested, not required. This requires us the freedom to pick and choose. If we agree with something, we don't have to use it. If we are not ready to use a step, slogan, or tool, we are free to wait. Many of us need time to come to terms with the spiritual nature of the particular program you're in, all 12 step A A N A O A Al Anon. If we are required, if we are required to believe in a higher power in order to participate in the group, we might never have continued to attend meetings. Eventually, many of us do come to believe in a higher power because we are free to come to our own understanding in our own time. That way, whatever we learn will have meaning for us. So I'm gonna just give you a, a sidebar here for a minute. So I'm a, I'm a very faithful Catholic. So the, the higher power had no issue with me. For But some people, it's just like Jiminy Cricket on their shoulder. It's um, the power of life, the water and nature, mother nature. It's whatever it is that can motivate you to have better self-care, okay? Not a formal religion in by any shape. We, when we take what we like and leave the rest, we give ourselves permission to challenge new ideas, to make decisions for ourselves and even change our minds. Today's reminder, because I am able to use whatever I find helpful and leave the rest, I can benefit from the experience, strength and hope of others and still follow my own heart. Quotes. With the help of this program and my higher power, I can take charge of fashioning, shaping, and choosing what kind of life I will have. And that came from the book in all of our affairs. So that's what I wanted to say. The last thing I want to do is uh, I really, the, the serenity prayer is a prayer that is said at every meeting, usually to start and to end. And so the first part of the prayer, I'm going to say to all of you, but when I lead a meeting, which is all, I did one on my birthday, the first time ever after my five month anniversary, I said, it's my five month anniversary in Al-Anon. It was my 60th birthday and it was my 39th wedding anniversary. No better time to lead a meeting. And so the serenity prayer goes like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, I like this part, which is the extended version. Living one day at a time enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next, amen. All right, my friends, that is everything that I have to say in the moment. I welcome any questions. So you are welcome to unmute yourself if you have a question and, and I will speak to my experience um, with my own disordered eating and then my experience as an Al-Anon member caring for people immensely who have addictions, including over uh, compulsive eating. And then secondly, I can give you a little bit more information on OA in general. But um, again, feel free to unmute yourself. Meanwhile, I'm going to share my screen um, because I want to show you what the uh, website looks like. So if you're, if you're interested in saying anything, unmute yourself and speak right up. And I'm going to grab this. All right, and like I said, Feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. You say, Gina, want to talk? So you can see now the Overeaters Anonymous website. It's OA.org. And this is where, you know, you can peruse this thing. I want to show you the finding meeting because that's really one of the first places you'll want to go along with looking at the quiz. And this is where I go. So for me, um, because I go to Al-Anon in person and because I go to AA in person, um, the online for me really works well. And I can listen to meetings like when I have long drives or, you know, um, 
when I'm cooking or different things like that. But you can find that online meeting or you can find face to face, um, whatever works for you. But this is where you're able to put in your time zone. You're able to put in a particular day. We can put in Thursday, tomorrow. And then you could pick the search options, which I mentioned to you. You can put time of day. Um, this is where I told you that um, I like to go to open meetings because I feel my, I, I do consider myself recovered from my exias and I am there as an Al-Anon member caring for people that I love and that's where they prefer you to be. Um, if you are one of those people in an open meeting, I'd like to right now because I'm just starting to experience OA, I go to the newcomers meetings, but you can see there's all kinds of meetings that are happening there. And then you could specifically focus on things like women and men and, and different aspect, uh, aspects here. And then, and then you can simply click on the meeting. And then immediately, you know, you're going to find, uh, you know, a nine o'clock meeting tomorrow, another nine o'clock meeting, an 11 a.m. meeting, a 12 o'clock meeting, a 3.30, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock. I mean, realistically, <laughs> 5 o'clock and another 5 o'clock. So again, there's so many options for you, but again, I'll just backtrack. There's the option of looking at face-to-face -face meetings as well. And I do encourage you to go to face-to-face -face meetings. You will just find such welcoming people and you will start to make friends. So I'm just gonna click on the Overeaters Anonymous logo and that'll get us back to here. Is OA right for you? And that's where you click on, let's find out. And this is where you'll take the quiz. And I'll talk about the particular question and then it'll kind of, you know, um, you know, give you a little comment from uh, somebody who's recovering or from uh, some literature that says, when my emotions are intense, whether positive or negative, do I find myself reaching for food? And then the little quote they give you is, my tendency was to eat because I had a list of resentments and I was going to show you. And I will tell you that I'm of the opposite. When I see people overindulging in food and in alcohol, I'm with the, I'll show you, I don't need to consume those things. So again, remember it's the, it's the control that we use when, with food in your life. So all of these happen here, you go through all of these things and then that will direct you from there. I'll just backtrack for a second. We'll go to this again. Uh, and this is where I went through with you. The journey begins. It allows you to look at what to expect, which I read to you. I read the introduction to the 12 steps. Pretty sure I did that. You can take your quiz. And then this is where I uh, started going when I started to experience OA as a family or friend. All right, stopping the share there. All right, well, I'm so thrilled that all of you have joined me tonight. Again, I'll give you a moment to unmute yourself if you have any questions about my personal experiences. Otherwise, I want to thank you for joining me. I do believe that the Mama G lifestyle is a repercussion of my experiences in my 60 years. Holy crap. And that all of them, good, bad, tragic, fantastic, um, allowed me to find peace and serenity with an eating program that I really consider sustainable for a lifetime right? Where we teach you getting into a healthy eating pattern. We teach you to choose foods that you find joy in. It gives you a nice little template to guide you. It allows you to reach a weight goal in either direction. It allows you to sustain that weight goal, but the psychological pull is what takes people away from their happy place with now their lifestyle in terms of their nutrition and exercise that I've taught them. And I will tell you, I've had a multitude of clients who have fallen off, jumped off, harmed themselves when they jumped off the old wagon or horse, who spent time, you know, taking all that weight and all that baggage back onto themselves. And then they know that they want to come home to the Mama G lifestyle. So that is why I feel such a connection and such a gift. And I feel this is truly a ministry. And I feel like this is such an opportunity for me to gift my life experience to you because I truly want you to live a long, healthy, independent, joyful life. I thank you for joining you. Take care and holler if you need me.